Andrea, is this a wrong link that I'm on? Recording in progress. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today and welcome to our session, Panel on Globalization. Without any further ado, please welcome our chair, Mr. Joseph Stiglitz, to open the session. Mr. Joseph Stiglitz, the screen is yours. Well, thank you very much. This is a very, very timely topic, especially for the World Congress of the International Economic Association. Uh, the views about globalization have gone through a dramatic change over the last uh, few years. Uh, there were always uh, debates, discussions about the nature of globalization. But then uh, President Trump uh, turned things on their head. The United States that had been the leader in advocating globalization became one of the stalwarts against it and in undermining the international uh, architecture. Today we have uh, four distinguished uh, economists uh, who've been deeply involved in uh, all the issues associated with uh, globalization and uh, uh, critics, or, and most importantly, uh, advocates of changes in the way that globalization is managed to make it work better and fairer for developing countries. We'll begin with uh, Danny Roderick, who is the uh, incoming president of the International Economic Association. Danny. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe. And um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening um, uh, to everybody, depending on, on, on where you are. Um, I'm trying to uh, share my screen, hopefully you'll be able to see it. I, I just have a, a couple of slides. It would be, I think, easier um, to, to, um, for people to look at my slides while I'm, I'm speaking. Um, as um, as uh, Joe mentioned, the, uh, there are different uh, conceptions of globalization and, um, and we're at the cusp of a transition of uh, trying to forge a, a new, a different type of globalization. And I think these different conceptions of uh, globalization um, have their counterpart in actually sort of historically different versions, historically uh, experienced different versions of globalization. So this is not just, um, you know, conceptually that it's possible to have a different globalization, it's we actually have experienced different globalizations. And I think it's important to understand that there are different versions of globalization. So really the debate is not 
about whether we should have globalization or we should not have globalization, or it's not about more globalization versus less globalization. It's really about the kind of globalization uh, that uh, that we should have. So I think I think there are at least you know three kinds of globalizations that we've had uh, going back to the original sort of the gold standard version of globalization. Um, then we had a version of globalization, which might be called the Bretton Woods version or the embedded liberalism version of globalization. That sort of went, I think, from the end of the Second World War um, until the end of the 1970s, early 80s, I would say, even though the formal Bretton Woods regime collapsed uh, in, the mid, in the mid 70s. Then I think um, starting in the, in the 1990s, we've had what I've called uh, a period of, of hyper uh, globalization. Uh, and I say this hyper globalization to distinguish it from the, the Bretton Woods era of globalization. And I think here in this matrix uh, along the columns, I've identified at least sort of five different elements of choice in terms of how do we design different globalizations, whether we seek capital mobility, whether we seek free trade in goods, whether we seek actually free trade in, in labor services. The, very importantly, the extent uh, to which um, rules uh, reach behind the borders and therefore constrain what domestic policymakers can do uh, through either agreed global standards or because of um, uh, decisions that are made by corporations or international financial institutions through inter integrated financial markets. And then finally, the extent to which these rules are enforced through the existence of formal multilateral or international organizations, whether they're actually enforced informally um, through um, either by self-help on the part of large uh, powers or through internalized norms uh, about how um, uh, good policy is, is, is practiced. So you can see that, that in terms of with the checks that I've put in the, in the boxes, that these how these different globalizations actually differed from each other. Um, and uh, there's one respect in particular where I want to draw your attention, that sort of which made hyperglobalization, the 1990 hyperglobalization problematic, is precisely the sense in which it actually um, uh, matched one of the features of the gold standard. And that is that, unlike in the case of the Bretton Woods regime, uh, the hyperglobalization re uh, regime significantly reached behind borders and therefore significantly constrained national policy autonomy. Now under the gold standard, most critically the case with respect to uh, money and credit policies because credit and, and monetary policy was tightly linked uh, to the fixed peg uh, to the gold and, and the requirement of free capital mobility. Um, the post-1990 hyperglobalization in many ways went even beyond that because of, of rules with respect to intellectual property, subsidies, services, agriculture, industrial policy, um, and uh, of course through the mobility of capital on, 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 on tax policies, what you can do. In fact, um, the um, uh, just announced uh, recently uh, the tax um, uh, 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 agreement, uh, global uh, tax agreement, is a kind of a, a, a sign of trying to escape from this, uh, from this that, that basically trying to, uh, to, uh, to impose uh, a, a different set of rules with respect to taxes. And I'm going to come to that uh, in a second. So the question is, how do we design the globalization of the future uh, understanding that we have agency, that we have, um, uh, we have, uh, we can rethink these different components. I think the key issue here is, is really how we think about striking the right balance between global rules and, and national uh, and, uh, this is a This is the, the balance between uh, a common standard, which would apply to all, uh, versus uh, uh, standards that might differ across different nations. Uh, which might be because they differ across different nations, might be tailored to each nation's needs, preferences, historical trajectory and perceptions and so forth. Uh, conceptually, I think the fundamental trade-off here uh, is a trade-off between the gains from trade. In other words, the more common the standard is, the more uh, uniform the standard is, the fewer the um, transactions cost and 
larger the size of the market and the, the greater the gains from trade. Uh, but of course, the greater the uniformity, uh, the less regulatory diversity there is. And therefore, we forsake the gains from regulatory diversity that each country might choose regulations that are more appropriate to their own standards, uh, to their own needs. So we see this, this, um, uh, this trade-off and the need to strike the right balance across the whole gamut uh, of different policy areas. Of course, with respect to corporate taxation, which is the one that is uh, the hot issue at the moment. Um, and and the here, the, the issue here, the trade-off is between do we negotiate a global uh, minimum corporate tax rate, uh, which would essentially constrain the ability of some countries um, uh, to have tax rates for their own need, perhaps for it to attract investment, perhaps because they have less need for revenue, perhaps because they see how the world works um, and the you know, elasticity of investment supply differently from other nations want to apply a different tax rate versus a much more uh, a, a kind of a domestic self-help kind of a way. In some ways, uh, the uh, the pillar one in the existing tax agreement goes in that direction, the apportionment. Uh, method where effectively each country can have its own tax rate and apportions uh, the global profits of corporations doing business there according to the share of the business they carry out in that particular jurisdiction. Um, uh, a, a, a very another live example is with respect to um, the uh, climate change policy, decarbonization. Here, the choice is between global regulations on emission or a global carbon tax uh, versus each country going its own way and then imposing at the border uh, the so called carbon border adjustments, which is to impose a tax or a tariff on uh, uh, imports coming from countries where there aren't similar. Uh, decarbonization policies or, or carbon regulations. Uh, this is actually increasingly being recognized um, as, as the way to go. Uh, it's a very live issue in, in Europe um, and, and this is likely to become, the presence of carbon border adjustments is likely to become a, a real um, uh, 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 issue. Um, we might extend the same principle, although I, 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 you know, I don't see much discussion of that, but it's very important to the, to the, um, to the uh, domain of labor standards. Uh, you can imagine um, uh, making existing core labor standards in the ILO much more effective, much more binding, that would be the global coordination route. Or you might, ex you might imagine uh, amending the rules of the uh, WTO uh, in a direction that actually uh, enables each country to protect its own labor standards and labor market regulations by essentially um, uh, um, uh, imposing uh, restrictions on imports coming from countries or firms or industries where labor rights are, 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 um, are, are repressed, uh, effectively upholding a country, uh, enabling each country to uphold its own domestic labor regulations when they're threatened uh, by uh, labor rights um, uh, repressions in other countries. That's exactly the analog uh, in the case of labor standards of the environmental policy with carbon border adjustments. Um, digital trade, I'm sure Rohinton will say, we'll talk about this, but again, the issue is, do we seek to maximize the gains from trade and the economies of scale and scope that we get from having a, a, a single cloud or single set or a single internet? Or do we have to bow uh, to the reality that different nations have different national security considerations, different privacy uh, considerations that will lead us down the path of, of different uh, national regional clouds. I think conceptually the way to think about where we draw the line uh, is to ask um, two questions. Um, one is, is there a clear global public good or a bad? And secondly, is there a clear case uh, that the policies in question create negative sum or bigger than neighbor outcomes? Um, now, I don't have much time to sort of apply these two filters to each one of these uh, policies, but I think this is a way to think conceptually about which do, which, where we should stand in this trade-off. The more there is a case, widely understood, globally widely understood case uh, for a global public good or a bad, the more obvious it is that individual policies 
uh, create a kind of a global negative sum game, uh, then the more there is an argument uh, for a global coordination. The less we can make that argument, I think the more we should resort uh, to self-help or at least allow countries uh, the autonomy to have their own policies. Now, to, just to, to, to end with, I think in the case of uh, corporate taxation, where I would come out on that, I think would be to say that we want a relatively uh, low uh, global corporate minimum, and I'm not necessarily very bothered by the 15%. Many people think it's that's low, but I think it's very important to strengthen and, and design appropriately uh, the apportionment scheme. That's the pillar one, uh, which is essentially the one that would allow each country to maintain their own uh, corporate tax rates. But I think that's the way that it is designed right now is actually very, very weak. Um, but in any case, um, let me just uh, stop here so I don't take uh, steal too much time from the other speakers, uh, but uh, maybe we can come back to each one of these specific issues. Um, uh, in, in greater detail. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Danny, for laying out the framework. I want to remind uh, the uh, uh, audience that we, uh, we'll, we're trying to have time uh, at the end for questions. You can send questions into the chat, uh, and I'll uh, try to read out some common questions that uh, a number of people raise. Um, Danny's given a very good overview of some of the general principles uh, guiding uh, globalization and, and uh, the factors that should determine some aspects of those rules. Um, and much of the remaining discussion will go look at some applications of these kinds of principles. I want to turn to Jody Ghosh, um, uh, formerly at JNU and, and uh, uh, teaching now at uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst. Jody. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be with this distinguished panel. I'm really honored and uh, uh, happy to be part of this. So I'm going to take up one of the issues that Danny raised in that ex excellent conceptual framework, the issue of capital mobility. And uh, why does that matter? Well, you know, if you look at the recent uh, changes in the global economy in the course of the pandemic, one of the most striking features is the very sharp differences in fiscal responses between advanced countries and developing and emerging markets. So the advanced countries have spent anywhere between 10 to 25, 30% of GDP additionally from what they would normally have spent in the course of this disaster. Developing countries, emerging markets, it's between four and 6%, the low income countries, 2% of GDP. There's a very, very stark and striking difference. Now, some of this you can explain by countries that have sovereign debt problems. They are paying a huge amount in debt service. They're de fiscally and uh, otherwise constrained. Some of this you can explain in terms of the balance of payments problems that could arise if you overspent, if you spent too much and your imports went up in consequence and countries are foreign exchange constrained. But that doesn't explain a significant number of emerging markets. So what is stopping them from spending? What is stopping countries that have 70 to 90% of their workforce in informal work without any legal or social protection from spending more on minimum compensation for their livelihood losses, for uh, spending more on recovery, spending more on generally ensuring that the economy not just recovers, but gets on a sustainable footing for the future. The reason really is the fear of capital flows. And this is where this aspect of globalization, the uh, opening up of capital markets, the integration of financial markets globally, which has become almost universal in the last uh, decade in particular, that has an overpowering and dominant influence. What's very interesting, I really like that distinction Danny made at the end about you know global public good and bad versus national interest. But this is one of those areas where I certainly believe this is a global public bad, but it's not so easily evident in the rest of the world. In the advanced countries, it's not so apparent that this is a global public bad, and therefore there's less effort to do something about it. Now, what exactly is, does this mean? It means that a country like India, my own country, is spending has spent practically not more in constant prices in 2020 than it did the previous year. In other words, there's been barely no increase in expenditure, not even 2% in real terms in increase in expenditure, which is unbelievable, right? Nonetheless, it has a large fiscal deficit. 
because of the fact that tax revenues have collapsed, as was natural during the lockdowns and, and the disruption of economic activity. But none, even so, it is facing threats from credit rating agencies saying, well, you know, you have a very large fiscal deficit, you better behave yourself, better not spend more because we will downgrade you. It is that fear which is restraining many governments. And this is not, I mean, India is an extreme example, but this is fairly widespread. You can see this happening in Thailand and Mexico and a number of other emerging markets as well. Now, the, the issue is then, therefore, what is the point of this capital market integration if it cannot even allow you to do counter cyclical spending in such obvious downturns where you have to have the fiscal expansion, where everybody's agreed that you have to have fiscal expansion? And of course, the answer is that developing countries are supposed to integrate because they will get better access to global finance. They will be able to increase domestic investment rates. So here's the thing, the remarkable fact is, certainly in developing Asia, but in a bunch of other uh, regions of the world, investment rates have come down after greater integration, not up, they have come down. And this is true in most of the emerging markets in Asia that suffered the East Asian financial crisis. It's also true in a number of other emerging markets in Africa and, Asia, uh, and Latin America. What it really has meant is that the possibility of outflow, the fact that you have gross inflows and then large gross outflows as well. Uh, you have to have very large, what is called self-insurance in the form of holding more and more foreign exchange reserves, which is why so many countries are, have been adding hugely to their reserves. India actually added $150 billion in reserves during the pandemic. We went from 450 billion to 600 billion, more than 600 billion in reserves during the pandemic which means really that you're not investing as much as you can even with your domestic savings because you're worried about in keeping aside this money for the future. It also means that you can never be sure of whether your capital will stay, the money that you're bringing in, the gross inflows will actually be around and available for even medium-term investment. Forget the long-term investment that you need. And you're constantly worried. Your fiscal stance, as I mentioned, is deeply constrained by this fear of capital outflow. In addition, you're also losing out, not just in the stocks, but you're losing out in the flows because all of these developing countries and emerging markets are giving out much more in terms of the rates of return on their liabilities than they are gaining in the rates of return on their assets. Whether it is in the form of the foreign exchange reserves held mostly in US treasury bills and so on, or it is in the form of private holders holding assets abroad because interest rates are much lower in the developed world. So we are losing both in terms of that fear of capital flight and the, the actual capital flight. Some countries are net capital exporters even today, like Malaysia and Thailand. And we are losing in senior losses in terms of the rates of return. What do we need to do then? We need to change this aspect of globalization to go back to Danny's table we need to actually change the rules that enable or allow this ridiculous process. And we need to put in restrictions on capital flows. Now, only some of this could actually be done by national governments. You would think that it's entirely in the domain of a national government, but it is no longer only in the domain of the national governments because global legal codes and architecture are now so dominant that even when a country would like to put in certain kinds of capital flows, there are many restrictions. This operates through contracts that are dominantly driven, not just the debt contracts, but many other contracts that are driven essentially by the city of London and New York City, uh, Wall Street, which determine the rules under which certain capital flows occur. This occurs through the WTO, use of the WTO, but in particular, other legal codes that are now inscribed in the bilateral investment treaties, in the free trade agreements that are signed by bilateral and plurilateral, and in uh, the economic partnership agreements that many, many countries are embroiled in. So we really do have to rethink this part of globalization and the legal codes that are inhibiting governments from doing what is the most obvious thing for their own citizens and residents. And we need to rethink the role of credit rating agencies. There are huge conflicts of interest. They operate to intensify the cycles. We really need public alternatives that can provide 
a clear, uh, shall we say, disinterested, uh, viable way of people to assess uh, the way in which global investment occurs. And fundamentally, we have to rethink this aspect of globalization, which is frankly no longer fit for purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jadi. Uh, next, Rohinton Menora from CG. Um, go ahead, Rohinton. Thank you, Joe, and it's, it's good to be back at the IEA, albeit virtually. I too would like to sort of pick up uh, from Danny's presentation and the taxonomy that, that he had of globalization and the choices it, it leaves us with, and do that from the perspective of the globalization that's ongoing, given the dominance of digital data and intangibles more broadly. So Danny had an opening table, which I thought was, was very useful, in which uh, the, the, the recent two phrase, uh, phases were hyper-globalization and then the question, what might the globalization of the future look like? Uh, in fact, within that era of hyper-globalization, some of us would argue that we've actually had a multi-speed globalization. And so hyper-globalization has been especially hyper in financial flows, as Jaiti pointed out, and indeed in the use and spread of information and communication technologies and in transformative technologies more broadly. It's been slightly less hyper when it comes to uh, trade and services flows and uh, distinctively less hyper when it comes to labor mobility as well as the capability of international norms and regulations to keep up with it. So that's what we face, in fact, and the, the tax example uh, that, that Danny gave is a very good one in which uh, global institutions and in architecture are trying to catch up to something that has run way ahead. And some of JIT's proposals on uh, capital mobility are in the same, are in that same category in which the horse has kind of left the barn in a great hurry and we're now trying to figure out ways uh, to rein the horse in. Um, when it comes to the digital economy and especially the ways in which we see data, uh, I would argue that not only have we had a multi-speed globalization, but actually it's been um, a, a fractured globalization and, and that we live in a world in which we have at least four broad data zones. Uh, one would be the state-centric uh, China zone, in which uh, data is owned, managed, controlled, whatever words you want to use, by the state, uh, presumably in, in the interests of the common good. But it's certainly not the citizen who is empowered uh, to do this. It's mirror image, and, and this is sometimes counterintuitive, but I'd argue is the case, is the US case, where again, citizens do not really control their data in any meaningful way. They don't have agency over many of the things that we do in North America, but um, it is firms, uh, big digital platforms that control, manage, and in many ways uh, represent the data age. And then you have that middle, which I think many countries uh, aspire to, that many people see as the gold standard and might well become over time the standard, and that's the European Union's GDPR zone, in which nominally at least uh, citizens control uh, or have more agency over their data and even the collective uses of the data that it's uh, that it's uh, it's put put to, and then you've got a kind of fourth zone, which is all the countries, which is to say the majority of countries in the world that don't belong to one of these three zones, and it's not as if they have sovereignty. Um, effectively, their choice is on which regime do they free ride off, or which regime are they most beholden to. That is the reality of globalization when it comes to data today. We don't have a single globalization. The zones don't really talk to each other. It's difficult to claim to be a global firm anymore just because of the way in which you have to treat data, which is effectively increasingly almost a distinct factor of production among other things. And it's those other things, the non-economic dimensions of data that we have to think about. And so. The first question I'd pose to us is, is this what we want? Are we, you know, all, all the folks who kind of said, you know, globalization imposes a norm that may not fit everyone, 
Well, the data economy now gives us an option, which is this kind of balkanized globalization. Uh, and is that necessarily optimal? Um, on the assumption that it might not be, but even if it is, there's a number of things that as a global community we have to sort out. Elsewhere, um, Taylor Owen and I have argued that we almost need the equivalent of a universal declaration of human rights that deals with the ethics and norms around new technologies and around what uses or what we, what we want out of data and how it should be used, gathered, and stored. There's also the question of taxation of digital platforms, which uh, with the G7 declaration were some steps towards resolving, but uh, highly imperfectly as, as we've heard. Um, there's the question of how do we make the data zones uh, in quotes talk to each other? How do we create, not unlike uh, the system of national accounts that the UN created in the 1950s, a global standard around the statistics that we use so that we at least understand what we mean when we talk about different forms of the data-driven or intangibles-driven economy. And so that leads me to my finals of proposal uh, for discussion, which colleagues and I at CG have been keen on for some time, which is to say, you know, after the financial crisis um, 12, 14 years ago, we recognized that global finance was a sector distinct from macroeconomics or monetary or development or trade. And that led to the creation of the Financial Stability Forum, which then became the Financial Stability Board with slightly more teeth. Uh, I wonder if we're not at a similar stage when it comes to data that it is distinct. It is not something you can distribute across the existing architecture. It's hard to conceive of e-commerce negotiations at the WTO, although they're happening, without having a prior national understanding of what data means and whether data localization, for example, is in the national interest or not, or in whose interest it is. So there's a series of these kinds of cross-cutting issues on which we, we need almost a separate distinct institution Moreover, the nature of governance has changed and probably has to be multi-stakeholder. And then the Bretton Woods institutions, for all their benefits, uh, one of major drawback is that they simply represent governments at, at, in an era in which uh, civil society and private firms matter at least as much. And so the proposal is to think about something like a digital stability board that would in effect serve as the umbrella organization to create norms around data, to perhaps issue authoritative reports, and over time to enforce regulations and norms that everyone has bought into. So I will, Joe, stop at that point and look forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. And our final speaker is Kaushik Basu, who is the outgoing president of the International Economic Association and has been long involved in many of these issues. Kaushik? Joe, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, uh, all of you, uh, Danny, Joyti, uh, Rohinton. Um, I, I want to start from something very topical and immediate concern, but I'm going to get back to the kinds of uh, matters that all of you have touched on a little bit from my perspective and my own research interests. What will happen to globalization given what we have gone through over the last year and a half, uh, nearly two years? I, I'm referring, of course, to COVID-19. Uh, there has been talk of deglobalization. Emmanuel Macron made a famous statement saying that globalization, the way we know it, is coming to an end. It'll be different. Uh, is that really uh, going to be the case that there is going to be deglobalization? Uh, uh, my own feeling is uh, far from that, actually, we will probably see the following kind of trajectory. Uh, bumpy road ahead on globalization, and maybe a certain amount of, I'm picking up on Rohinton's term, balkanized globalization, large segments, uh, globalized within themselves, but cut off from one another. There may be spheres of influence of China, United States, etc. But in the long run, and not even very long run, I think medium term, we are going to see hyper globalization. It's going to pick up. And for the following reason, one is, of course, the era of hyper-globalization -global we were coming into because of the rise of digital technology, 
the world is hooking up, not just by uh, travel, and but through digital links. And over the last 40 years, um, we have seen in the case of India, it's been a major sort of from the mid 1990s, it is the global linkages has given the India's economy a big boost from that time. So that is indeed one factor. But what's happened over the last year and a half is really a classic, classic case of Arovian learning by doing. Digital technology had really progressed in leaps and bounds, but how primitive we are in its use, we now realize that for every lecture, every conference, we would travel, we would descend there for that meeting. And now we've all become comfortable just sitting in wherever you are, linking up uh, and, and do, doing your job. This is the technology which was already there. The COVID-19 is an exercise in learning by doing for the world for a year and a half. And I think this is going to have enormous effects from just lectures and meetings, the kinds that we are engaged in. I think there's going to be a huge amount that will take this form, but also things that were taking place earlier, outsourcing. People have learned better ways to do this. So I feel after this, period of bumpy deglobalization, uh, balkanized globalization, we are going to see a period of very rapid globalization. And the question is, what do we do about it? Because there is nothing that is obvious that any individual can do to change the nature of globalization. Yes, I, I do think that the global laws, regulations are important. Global taxation rules are important. I'll come to some of those, but the broad thrust of globalization will continue. <clears throat> Let me touch on one thing, which I, sitting in the United States, being from India, I watch this debate all the time, and I feel the debate gets wrongly constructed. This is the outsourcing, which is one form of massive globalization, which is the need for workers here. You suddenly realize that for a whole lot of work, you don't really need uh, to use the workers here. You can ship it out to Bangalore, to Manila, to Cape Town, you can have workers over there do the work for you and digitally connect. This is the outsourcing business. This does cause stress in rich countries, in upper middle income countries, because their workers are, are coming under a certain form of competition from elsewhere. But this is one competition that I would not grudge because it is the poorer workers elsewhere who are being linked to the global world. The place where I feel this debate gets missed stated is if you listen to a lot of the conservative debate debate in the United States, it's always made out to be labor versus labor. We are defending our labor. What is glossed over, I, I see it almost never touched on is every time outsourcing takes place, a part of the work is sent elsewhere to the world, whether it's outsourcing or any form of work being sent over, any component of a final product being sent elsewhere. Yes, some of the jobs are going and wages go up there, but profit shoots up over here. So every time this happens, profit shoots up. So what is treated as just a labor versus labor issue actually is predominantly, it is both, but predominantly a wage income versus profit income issue. And that is never touched on because that immediately draws attention to a different kind of way to tackle this problem, which is to transfer some of this uh, profit back to the workers. This I feel is where we have to pay a lot of the attention and something that a whole lot of people have written starting from Marty Weitzman, whose work was that time treated as a theoretical work, the shared economy, a certain amount of profit sharing, actually quite a bit of profit sharing is the route that we have to go. That is profit earned. It is not just within a corporation a part of the profit is earned by workers, but a big chunk of the profit has to be taken away by the state and redistributed as shares to people across the board so that every time there is outsourcing, which is using the global links, profit bumps up, ordinary people's income goes up because they are getting part of this. Let me come to another problem and I am going to actually touch on this inequality in a moment, but uh, um, this is, something that I've written about, which again, we've become acutely aware of is oligopoly 
the conventional oligopoly on which we have done theorizing from right from 1838, uh, I'm thinking of uh, Gurnall's work in 1838, the nature of oligopoly is changing dramatically. And this is getting countries linked up in very different ways. I'm taking two polar cases. One polar case is the standard polar case we use, which looks realistic because we use it so many times economists, we begin to believe that's the way things work. But I'll create another polar case, which will seem unrealistic, but both are moderately unrealistic, moderately realistic. One polar case is where, suppose you have an automobile industry in the world with 100 firms involved in the conventional analysis, and I'm, the polar case, 100 firms producing cars, one in China, one in India, one in uh, Brazil, uh, uh, two in the United States producing cars, 100 of them. But what I have done a little bit of theoretical work on is I call a serrated uh, industry where 100 firms are involved, but one firm produces all the wheels. Another firm produces all the gearboxes. I run out of, uh, since I don't know the parts of an automobile, I, I run out of examples, but different components being produced, one in China, one in India, one in Brazil, two in United States. Now look at the kind of problem that can arise, which during the um, pandemic was beginning to take place, which is that if one particular country stops production in the olden days with 100 firms in 100 countries producing cars, if one stopped production, one hundredth of the car production would stop and there would be shortages because one hundredth of the production has stopped. Now, with components being produced in different countries, if one stops, the automobile industry will be hitting a roadblock all over the world because you can't run cars without wheels. One little case cropped up in India. This was last year after the outbreak of the pandemic, which made us acutely aware of this the pharmaceutical industry, government of India, in this case, very sensibly tried to create rules that when you're having the lockdown, you still allow the pharmaceutical industry to produce. So yes, their workers could come in certain ways, things were specified, but the pharmaceutical industry started stumbling. This happened for a short while because they discovered that one component which they need is a strange component, which they were not getting. In India, they use gum, mainly from the informal sector to stick the labels on medicine bottles. That sector had been hit by the lockdown and it had escaped attention that you need that sector to function for the auto, for the pharmaceutical industry to be able to stick the labels. So suddenly when you get this one component running short, the whole industri industry stumbles. This happened only for a short while, but this is an example. But this also means countries get a huge amount of power. You don't have to actually stumble. You can threaten the world that I will stop the production of wheels if you don't do something. So we are reaching a rather tense situation globally where these kinds of warfare could build up and we have to begin to pay attention to this. Let me just touch on one thing and then I may be able to come back to others, which um, Joe um, has written about all actually of you have taken a position on the need for greater equality. I feel that if you, the only reason why we don't get completely shocked is because we are so used to the crazy levels of inequality. And here, I feel there is a lot that you can do without taking away the profit motive through profit sharing, where you take away, say 50% of the profit is taken away. So you're getting much less because the whole range of incomes is cramped. My hunch is, if at the top end, you make the taxation very, very progressive. I remember uh, Joe gave, giving a talk at the New York Stock Exchange 2019, where you said something like this. If you make it much more progressive, the taxation system, the conventional view that this is going to damage incentive, I don't think is correct because at the bottom end, people are worried that uh, how much you get will determine how much you work. But at the top end, think of the richest people. The reason why you want to earn a bit more is the competitive thing. So take, for instance, Jeff Bezos, whose wealth is $200 billion, and uh, Bill Gates, $130 billion. I may be getting it wrong by $1 or $2 billion, but at that level, it does not matter. Now, if you tax their 
top end of that income massively. So let us suppose when they earn $10,000, they get to keep $1 at the top end. Massive taxation. Will they stop working? I don't think so. Because at that end, what you're doing at the top end, it's like a soccer match. You're trying to, it's the rank that matters. So even if your income through a lot of work, you get another dollar. Once you've already got a minimum amount, competition will not stop because the ranks will remain the same. Bill Gates will still try to go further to catch up with Bezos, though all of them have collapsed. So I feel you can do a lot without damaging incentives and you can do a lot in terms of regulations while the broad trend of globalization continues. There were other detailed matters I wanted to touch on, but maybe I'll be able to come back later on. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Kaushik. Um, I want to begin the discussion on a number of questions about trying to forecast where globalization is going to go. And that reflects on the question that Danny began this discussion of the various episodes of globalization. And I want to put forward a, a, a couple of alternative hypotheses uh, that uh, help explain uh, the changes and maybe each of you could reflect on, on how you evaluate this and how in the areas that you've just uh, talked about, uh, it, it, it helps shape uh, your thoughts about where things are going. One of the explanations of the change in globalization is the change in production, uh, structure of production and technology. Obviously, that was very important for Rohindran. Uh, we didn't have a data technology uh, issue 50 years ago, but we do today. But you know, 100 years ago, we were trading uh, commodities. 50 years ago, we were trading manufactured goods. We've moved into a service sector economy. Many things are less global. There's a natural less globalization in the service sector economy. Some people hypothesize than the manufacturing. So that's one possible explanation. There's another possible explanation has to, having to do with power relationships that uh, power relationships both within and between countries. When you had a dominant power like the United States, it was in its interest to promote globalization. You had colonialism, a kind of globalization. But when you went into a uh, multipolar world, uh, things changed. And uh, when you go into a populism within the United States, uh, picking up on what Kaushik said, the labor capital battle, uh, globalization is going to change. So that says that globalization has changed basically because of politics and, and uh, uh, within and uh, between countries. A particular manifestation of that difference is uh, a, a reflection of uh, Francis Fukuyama's uh, end of history. Uh, in the era of hyper-globalization, there was this notion that uh, we would all be liberal democracies and, and market economies and that globalization would accelerate this convergence. Nobody believes that anymore. And globalization in a world split with uh, different economic, political systems and values is going to be much more <clears throat> difficult. And the final uh, hypothesis has to do with uh, our understandings of economics have changed, that in the beginning of the era of hyper-globalization, there was a belief that everybody would be better off, everybody trickle-down economics. You could sell globalization as helping everybody. Today, nobody believes that. Uh, that promise of globalization didn't work out. Uh, some countries did well, some countries did poorly, and some groups within countries did uh, very poorly. And uh, the precepts that Danny enunciated, what should be globalization, uh, rules that affect cross-border externalities, it's very clear, as Jody emphasized, that the rules of capital market liberalization were not about regulating cross-border externalities. They were rules that were imposed by the powerful because it was in their interest. It wasn't uh, that uh, 
they were trying to control uh, these externalities. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Uh, one of the interesting questions that was posed was, with all the stimulus going on, are we going to have a repeat of what happened And after the 2008 crisis, all countries have uh, uh, externalities on the less developed countries that they don't take into account. So uh, let me just open the question to the four of you about uh, what is your view about uh, the underlying drivers of what is going on and how does that shape your view about where things are going? Danny, you want to begin? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are two things that's driving the, um, uh, um, the immediate future. One is uh, the, the US-China geopolitical competition, which I think is going to color everything that happens with respect to uh, the future of global supply chains, the future of digital trade, um, uh, the future of high-tech high -tech trade. So um, there I see it's almost inevitable that just because um, of this uh, competition uh, that a certain degree of segmentation um, of, um, of the world economy, it seems to me to be inevitable. So on that score, I'm, I'm less optimistic than, uh, but, you know, than Rointen on the feasibility of thinking about some global standards or uh, from Kaushik on, on the amount on sort of the future of globalization. Now that's actually rather, you know, I think what that means for developing countries is I think they're going to be increasingly forced to choose a camp, uh, whether they go with China or whether they go with the United States. That's essentially going to be the US position. You're either with us or, you know, yeah, you, you know, you're going to be left in the lurch. And that's very uncomfortable. And I think this is something that we as economists ought to, you know, speak out against that, that sort of making sort of the international economy hostage to a kind of a, you know, US's own perceived competition in geopolitically with China, I think is very dangerous. Um, the second thing, um, which uh, the second trend, which may be rather more short lived is that as you, as Joe, you've mentioned uh, often enough, you know, the whole intellectual conversation about economics and globalization in the United States has changed significantly. Um, and that's, uh, it reflects itself in these global rules on taxation and for, but, you know, it, so it, that is an opening for reshaping globalization, uh, but it doesn't, you know, um, it, it, you know, sort of uh, change the fact that even when global, you know, there's a more, you know, soft, you know, so softer global, <laughs> globalization, it is still reflecting the national interest, the perceived national interest of the United States. That's why we get such a, we get in principle a good thing, a global ag agreement on corporate taxes, but it's still highly lopsided uh, because it reflects the outsized voice of, of the United States in, in the system. Um, so, you know, the, the, the trouble with global rules is, is not just that you get, you know, the global, the powerful countries writing the rules, it's more that, you know, powerful, powerful interests within powerful countries write the rules. And I, and I think, you know, that's been the, the problem with hyper-globalization more than U.S. power in some sense. So there's a rebalancing that's going on in the United States, but I think it's only partial and, and perhaps it'll be short term. But I think I see that as the second uh, driver. Can I come in as well, Joe? Yeah. Look, I, I, I pick up where, again, Danny led off by, by asking ourselves, what is the driver of the digital economy? What are the main characteristics of this kind of economy? And uh, I'd suggest that it is driven by technology and by intellectual property, which is mostly almost entirely proprietary. And so we're now in an era in which um, uh, rents uh, created by the artificial monopoly of, uh, of IP are what create the wealth for a few. And the few could be a few parts of the globe, but also a few people within uh, those few parts of the globe. Um, arguably, especially with data, it tends to generate natural monopolies. The more data you have, uh, the bigger you are, the bigger you are and more data you have, the better your product, therefore more consumers. And so it creates a cycle of natural monopoly. And yes, there is a competitive ecosystem uh, 
around the digital platforms, but there's no question that what's driving all of that is a highly uh, monopolistic structure. And that actually connects with the point Danny made about US-China. I think it's, it might be somewhat simplistic, but not inaccurate to suggest that some of the, a lot of the US-China rivalry is driven by the fact that both see this uh, wealth creation as, as a bit of a zero-sum game zero-sum game economically, but also in terms of influence and social values and political systems. Um, and, and, and that's not just uh, out there. If you look at the composition of the S&P 500 20 years ago, intangibles, which are not the same as data, they're slightly, they cover slightly different things, but mostly representative of digital and data, accounted for about two-thirds of the value of firms on the S&P 500. Today, it's 85%. So there's no question that the nature of wealth is being driven by a set of intangibles led by IP, uh, led by branding, led by data. And this is creating behaviors, first mover advantage, strategic behavior, which is actually driving globalization. And so I take Kaushik's point about uh, taxation and the changing nature of taxation quite seriously. I think we should be thinking much more about moving away from consumption-based taxes, which have sort of driven public finance policy for the last three or four decades back towards profits taxes, wealth taxes of different kinds, and then the public provision of various kinds of systems. I can see that, conceive of that nationally. I'm afraid I still don't conceive of that internationally for the global public goods we require. So in that sense, I'm not as optimistic as Danny might think. But we do need to understand this wealth creation uh, structure to think about what next with globalization. Let me ask, in the last few minutes, uh, 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 ask another question that's related. Um, uh, the most important global public good right now is controlling uh, the pandemic. Um, another very important public good, global public good, is climate change. And in both of those areas, we need uh, high levels of cooperation. But focusing for a moment on the pandemic, the critical rules that, that were, have been talked about are the intellectual property rules. And uh, the question is, are those rules being written in ways that promote societal well-being, general welfare, or do they reflect power relationships? And we're having a test of that right now because of the debate over the vaccine waiver at the WTO, where the basic rules have been written already that say that there is uh, the right to have compulsory licenses. But Germany in particular uh, is trying to impede the vaccine waiver, which main effect of which is to lower transaction costs and transaction costs in this area really make a difference in terms of the speed of getting the vaccines uh, uh, to uh, produced and, and getting the pandemic under control. You want to reflect on how what's going on in the pandemic reflects uh, the kind of debate that we've been discussion we've been having on the nature of globalization. Could I, could I come in on that, Joe? Sure, Jari. So, you know, I'm so happy you raised this point because as you have, uh, you know, continuously made this point over and over again about the issue of intellectual property and, and the issue of vaccines, of course, it reflects global power relations. Of course, it re reflects the power of a few types of very big companies, pharma, finance, you know, certain kinds of uh, uh, other digital companies and so on to not just preserve their monopoly, but extend it and uh, into many other areas. And that this is extremely counterproductive and it's obviously a global public bad, I think in, in, in that sense. I don't think we realize fully what impact this is going to have on at least the need medium term of globalization. And I, I mean this quite seriously across Africa, there is now a recognition that there is no point in having any expectations from the G7. Let's, let's just put it frankly, because they don't deliver. Every vaccine that has been administered in Africa has been purchased, despite a supposed COVAX facility. 
They are not being given the knowledge to produce it themselves. They are not being given the capacity to buy. They have been sort of beaten at the post by the big countries that jumped the queue and bought up vaccines way in excess of their own requirement. And this is leading to continuous waves of the pandemic, which they have no idea when they will finally get out of. This is leading to demands across the continent for much more significant industrial policy and generation of knowledge. The kind of thing China realized 20 years ago and got moving on is now, I think, very, very strong. So in a way, you know, this issue of the two camps, I think it's absolutely true, you know, countries will be asked to choose. But why would countries choose a grouping that doesn't really offer you anything? Which says, well, you know, you have to go by our rules, but you will lose because you will have very volatile capital flows. You will lose because you will have seniorage losses. You will lose because in periods of crisis, we are not going to offer you any support. And we will grab whatever is available of the thing that can stop the pandemic. And we will not allow you the knowledge that will enable you to produce more of it. So I think there is a real sense in which what has happened in the last one and a half years is going to color certain countries' attitude to globalization. And whether that plays out into a much longer dynamic, I don't know, but I think we're definitely going to see this in the next few years. Let me ask one final question um, that come across the uh, chat, uh, and it's related to the, uh, what you just said, uh, Jody. Um, how should African countries, and obviously there are a lot of differences in, in different African countries, how should they relate to uh, globalization? Uh, one of the issues, for instance, to go back to the tax issue that Danny talked about, Nigeria has expressed uh, some reservations about some certain aspects of uh, the tax agreement, including, uh, I believe in particular, the arbitration, mandatory arbitration of disputes. Uh, how should they respond to the pressure that they will be put under both to join one camp or another, or to sign up to rules that may not be in their best interest. Rohinder, you've been involved a lot in African in Kaushik. I, I mean, I'd, I'd begin where Celestine uh, also, which is that there is no single uh, Africa. I think it is a country by country choice. Uh, in many parts of Africa, that that battle for influence might be in some ways lost uh, with the advent of China. I thought uh, the gains India was making with its soft power approach were kind of lost in the, frankly, debacle over vaccine supply in, in the last few weeks and months. And at the end of the day, um, uh, the one opportunity that the digital economy holds for Africa is actually two. One is location no longer matters. And the second is the series of raw materials uh, and, and various essential goods that, that Africa contains uh, for the digital economy to continue. And so the question for Africa is what affords it the best uh, opportunity for development, given that most of the technology that is now coming to play is going to be truly labor saving. And so the, the model we've had after the industrial revolution of getting in at the bottom of the uh, value chain and then moving up is probably not open. And so some combination of wealth creation and wealth capture is what's going to drive African uh, sort of development uh, economies for some time. And whichever model provides those two, uh, I mean, I hope it's not the, sort of the way, J as dark as Jaiti puts it, but if it is, then choices for many countries would be frankly clear. So can I just jump in on, um, actually on the vaccine market, I have rather detailed views there isn't time to go into. I feel we are handling it very poorly and really need to do it differently. But I want to make a general point, which um, uh, all of you, Danny, just now mentioned about um, if the world, the main tension point becomes that there are two superpowers and the world is, it's balkanized uh, because there's a movement of capital and things like that within each, but two parts. And people are uh, small countries, African, Sub-Saharan African countries, uh, countries all over the world are given a choice. You're either with us or with them. One thing that we need to be aware of, and I think this will be an alarming world, because really there won't be that choice. 
it will be the two big powers that will try to say you are with us and the other one will say you are with us and we've seen that historically countries will get caught in being pulled into EU, you will not have that space for deciding which block you belong to. So I feel it's going to be a dreadful world if it is really two powers trying to consolidate their space. And this is the time when we ought to get the, from ordinary thinkers to people should get active in the space of what kind of a world do we want and the world that we are heading towards can really be dangerous if it is just two poles that are trying to carve out their own space. Let me ask one question. Uh, we have, it seems that we have a little more time. And that is one aspect of globalization uh, that uh, everybody was uh, emphasized before was uh, the efficiency of global supply chains. And one of the things that came out in the pandemic was that these seemingly efficient global supply chains were not very resilient. How do you think about that? Is, is this uh, a time that leading to more onshoring? Is it a result of not learning the lesson of 2008 that uh, it's important to manage risk and the private sector is a very bad manager of risk and there's going to be a need for more government oversight of global supply chains? Uh, any reaction to, to uh, that important aspect of globalization? Charlie, yeah. quick, yes, and very quickly, Joe. You know, I think that uh, the massive sort of generation of the global value chains and and the complexity of them resulted from first of all improvements in container technology that enabled a, a major cheapening of these movements, but also uh, the the need for regulatory arbitrage because you could actually exploit rules and regulations along with low, lower labor costs in different parts of the world. I think both of these are actually going to be significantly altered by the kinds of digital changes that Rohinton was talking about. In other words, I see more, if you like, onshoring, reshoring happening really because the technological changes are now making it possible to do with much less labor. And because of the fact that you've managed so much the regulatory changes that you no longer need that kind of playing different rules against one another in, in order to be so-called more efficient, or I would just say to, in order to reduce costs. So yes, I think there will be less of those supply chains. I, I, maybe I disagree. I feel this is what's going to happen is that if you do um, try to not offshore um, as, as some of your business, what will happen is in the product market, you'll get competition from other countries that are doing offshoring and picking up the advantage. So I feel some of global competition will be such that it is not going to work out that way. The offshoring is going to continue simply because on the product market, you will lose out if you don't do. So I, I, I feel it's going to continue and we'll have to learn to live with that. Let me give you a little bit of my view, which is that there's a fundamental market failure here. That is to say, to put it in, grand theory, there's not an Arab Dubu securities, the risk of securities, that uh, we haven't, uh, uh, our price, uh, our, we don't give uh, rewards for firms for being resilient. And there's a kind of short-sightedness in markets. And so uh, Germany might sign an agreement uh, to get Russian gas uh, because it's cheaper, but not thinking about what happens if there is a supply interruption. And uh, that that generates externalities, which they don't internalize. And that uh, one of the consequences may be the governments will have to step in in those areas where supply interruptions are important. And uh, therefore, uh, make sure that at least in some areas, there is at least uh, enough domestic capacity production that there will be greater resilience than we saw uh, in the pandemic. And that will change the nature of, of globalization at least to some extent. Any reactions? Joe, yeah, can Joe, I come in? Okay, Danny, after you. Sorry, yeah, I mean, just building on what you said, Joe, I, I think resilience is probably the wrong term here. I think that's sort of leading us astray because 
it's really reliability of supply. And okay, so yeah, a reliability. Resilience actually would call for diversification of sources of supply. So resilience is in some sense, if diversification is the greatest argument for globalization, you want to have as many sources as in many different parts of the world as possible. So I think what's really driving this concern uh, is reliability of supply and the, and what firms have not properly priced, to put it in your term, job, Joe, is that governments would intervene uh, to put their own national interest first, supply. Um, and, and that's exactly what we're now seeing with you know, governments essentially investing, at least in the United States, investing in building up domestic supply chains. Uh, to essentially fix that, uh, that that problem. Now you might say, now that firms have seen it, they will, uh, you know, they'll price that risk, but of course they want once things go back to normal, uh, which is why um, I think it's very important what the United States is doing. And that's, I think it's going to be an inevitable outgrowth of this. You will see much more industrial policy, so to speak. And we, we see this now in the United States is explicitly had, United States has always had an industrial policy, now it has an industrial policy which is calling it by its name and it does it's not embarrassed to put it on the white house you know sort of uh, website and so forth saying this is our industrial policy and a lot of it is in fact uh, investing in these domestically in the supply chain joe i, I wanted to just come in on uh, your remark um it actually this i feel is the biggest concern in the world that th these supply chains are giving us huge economies of scale but the vulnerability and risk that comes with that are also growing. And this could be absolutely destructive for the world. One thing which I think will happen is countries will begin to stock up as a precaution so that if for a short period you're held to ransom, you've got your own stocks like United States right now has oil reserves that you can for some time hold off with your own reserves. Countries will begin to build up all different kinds of reserves because in case there is a shock, but how long can you use the reserves and what will poor countries do? So ultimately what you do need, this is one area where some kind of global governance that you can't hold another country to ransom by suddenly in, uh, disrupting the supply chain is the way we will go because not using these to internalize supply chains, even if a couple of big countries can do that, for a whole lot of countries in the world, it's impossible. The economies of scale are too big for the country to produce all different components within this. So we will have to live with this, but we need to change the rules of the game for this to be viable. I'm not, I'm not endlessly optimistic, so I don't know whether we will succeed in doing that. Maybe not. So the last question I think we'll have time for, it, it has to do with these uh, global externalities as the rationale for uh, uh, cross-border rules. Um, the, um, you know, as, as I look through various uh, rules that have been adopted, uh, it's striking to me how few of them are actually directed at cross-border externality and how many of them are really directed at, you might say, redistributive power relationships. So let me give you an example. The one that Jody talked about, about capital market liberalization. Hard to say that that was driven, the attempt by the IMF to, uh, in earlier days, to force countries to liberalize the capital market. It wasn't an externality. Um, the European rules on deficits and debts, those limits, uh, hard to justify in terms of cross-border macro externalities. But the really important externality, which was robbing taxes of your neighbor, which is what we see in the race to the bottom in corporate income tax, Lux Ireland and Luxembourg. They didn't deal with that cross-border externality uh, in the design of the EU. So I guess the question is, as I look across you know, the rules, I constantly see uh, important externalities not being dealt with, and the things that are being dealt with are not externalities. Um, am I wrong about that? And, and what do we do about that? Well, you know, Joe, as you have said so eloquently just now, and also over and over again in your work, the rules are written by the powerful. 
And uh, they're not, as you mentioned, about externalities. They're not about making the systems better. They're about making the powerful even more powerful economically. So how do you confront that? By generating a countervailing power, by mobilizing sufficient noise and reaction and public response to force a change in those rules. And I think that is as true of intellectual property as it is of rules regulating capital flow and rules regulating sovereign debt. There isn't enough pushback from people. And that's because also broadly people, especially in the advanced economies are largely ignorant of the implications even on themselves. So I think part of it is more and more people knowing about it and then sufficient social mobilization, popular mobilization to generate the pushback. Um, I, Joe, I, I agree with, with you and, and Jaiti uh, that of course it, it's you know, power is, is, is playing a big role. But I also think that if we're going to move ahead, we need good conceptual foundation. We need a good understanding of what the right framework would be. I, I, I don't think we're no, there. We're there. Because um, I, I don't think, for example, the, no, the notion of externality captures what we're after. Um, because there are practically anything that a government does has a cross-border externality. Um, you know, if, if I invest more in my education system, build up my human capital, I have an adverse effect on all my trade partners. Uh, that have a comparative advantage in skill intensive goods. So that's a negative externality to a whole bunch of other countries there. We never, we don't think, however, my, in, in my, in my education policy is an externality that ought to be globally uh, um, uh, coordinated. If I, you know, increase my highway, um, you know, sort of if I put as highway speed limit, I'm going to be driving down the price of oil, hurting the interests of oil exporting countries. We don't think that traffic regulations ought to be you know, globally. So I think the, the and, and, and that's why I said in my comments, I think the, the critical issue is not cross-border externality, it's something whether there's a negative, a globally negative uh, net sum. Um, and, and, and so there you have a much stronger argument uh, for global regulation. The problem arises precisely because countries cannot argue and agree on a whole bunch of different domains, whether certain policies are globally negative net sum or not, because the perceptions of these policies are very different. You know, you know, China might say, when I'm doing industrial policy, I'm simply, you know, internalizing externalities. This might have a negative effect on U.S. exporters, uh, but I'm, you know, this is an externality that I'm feeling domestically. That therefore, it's globally, it's not negative net sum. It's actually negative positive sum, although there's some. Uh, com companies abroad are being hurt. So we need systems that are actually global understand global systems that are that are robust to these disagreements um, that are going to be always part of this. And I think that's so I don't want to go on, want to go on and on and on about this. But I think that's a lot of what I've been writing recently is trying to figure out what systems might like that might look like. Yeah, I let me get, clarify. Uh, you know, the distinction, distinction in standard economics is between, you know, pecuniary and non-pecuniary externalities, because pecuniary externalities we don't worry about because they're simply redistributive. In your vocabulary, they don't have a, 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 an aggregate sum effect. But one of the things when you go out of the Era de Bru first best world, even pecuniary externalities can have zero uh, aggregate sum effects. That was uh, the Greenwald Stiglitz theorem about how with uh, imperfect uh, and asymmetric information and complete risk markets, even pecuniary externalities can have uh, aggregate uh, effects. And I, I think you're right. What we're trying to do is assess not only where are those aggregate effects, but where they're potentially significant and where there are particular potentially significant distributive uh, effects as, as well uh, that can be adverse to certain uh, weaker countries. Did anyone want to come in? We, we've gone over our time. Well, let me thank you all. I think this has been a highly enlightening. There, there are so many topics in globalization. We haven't covered all of them, but I think we've covered some of the most important and some of the uh, newer topics, uh, including uh, 
digital re regulation, digital, the, the change in geopolitics, uh, the new views on uh, 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 globalization that are emerging, uh, the consequences of the pandemic. Um, so uh, this is going to be a topic that we will be continuing to discuss, not only in the next World Congress, but also uh, in for around the world. I, I think there's probably no topic that's going to be more important to the well-being of the world. Um, and it's really important that we get these global rules right. Um, and it's important both for global growth, but also for uh, global equity and within countries and, and between countries. So thank you all for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. And next thank year you. in person. Thank you. That was great. So Joe, has the recording stopped?